Hey, hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Scott Luton and Mary Kate Love with you here on Supply Chain. Now, welcome to today's live stream. Mary Kate, how are you doing today? Doing great, doing great. This one is going to be a fun one for sure. Oh, it is, it is. So folks, just like Mary Kate said, great show teed up here today. So there's a world of opportunity out in the parcel shipping universe. And today we're featuring an incredible expert that's going to fill us all in. We're going to have a lot of fun too. Hey, what's going on with changes at UPS and FedEx? How are shipping uh, shippers approaching freight auditing these days? Hey, what do I need to know for my next rate negotiation? Stay tuned for all of that and more. And Mary Kate, one more question. How would you like to learn from a team that manages $11.2 billion Jeez. in parcel spend? Goodness gracious. Well, you're in for a treat because that's what we have. That's the opportunity we have here today. Mary Kate should be a great show, huh? Yeah, this is an industry too that, you know, in doing my research to prepare for this show, I learned so much. So I know our listeners are going to leave with a lot of knowledge and maybe debunk some of the assumptions they had about this industry. Cause I know for me, at least that's what happened when I was preparing. Yes, Mary Kate, I got to tell you, I've done a whole bunch more LTL shipping than parcel shipping. So I look forward to learning a ton yeah. from our expert here today. Um, all right. Hey folks, a couple last reminders before we get started. Number one, Hey, let us know what you think. Share your comments throughout this live discussion, much like uh, our dear friend TV, old Tom Valentine here. Awesome to be here. Scott and Mary Kate. From Atlanta, the one nice. and only Tom Valentine. Shashi is here as well from Dubai. Great to see you back with us, Shashi. And uh, happy Aid Mubarak to everyone around the world as well. Great point. David from Miami Beach. I bet that's pretty uh, via LinkedIn. Great to see you here, David. And then secondly, the other reminder, if you enjoyed today's show, and I bet you will, because I'll tell you, Mary-Kate and our guest, quite the one-two punch, be sure to share it with a friend or your network. They'll be glad. You did. All right, Mary Kate, you ready to get to work? Yeah, let's do it. Want to welcome in our featured guest today, Robin Meyer, the one and only Robin Meyer, Senior Vice President of Parcel Strategy and Solutions at Transportation Insight. Hey, hey, Robin, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? Wonderful. Great to have you. I'll tell you, Mary Kate and the whole team had a great time with you pre-show, our previous <laughs> conversations. I'll tell you. We have got quite the dynamo here today. Are you ready to go plugged in, fully caffeinated? <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> yes. I think fully caffeinated may be a little scary for everybody. <laughs> uh, okay, good. <laughs> but I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that consideration. We got a, a slew of folks. We got Saul back with us from Ohio State. Hey, home of the uh, Hawkeyes, right? Ohio State Hawkeyes. Uh, Jared C. from ATL. John Moore, Indiana Rocks, John says. <laughs> And Nadim is back with us from Saudi Arabia. Great to see you, Nadim. Uh, Y'all keep the comments coming. We got a great conversation. But Mary Kate and Robin, before we get into uh, a ton, uh, a truckload, a true truckload of insights from Robin on the world of parcel shipping, let's have a little fun first. So, folks, it's National Hug Your Dog Day. So, if you're big dog people, like uh, at least our family is, give them a hug every hour. National Siblings Day. It's Encourage a Young Writer Day. And global work from home day, which has taken on a whole new meaning these last few years. But my question for you, Robin, our question for you, Robin, centers on your love for the Ohio State University mm -hmm. Buckeyes. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, here on the heels of March Madness, one of the best times in, in all the college sports, let's talk about your best Buckeyes experience in recent memory. Oh, wow. Okay. So uh, I go back and visit a lot for the football games. I watch a lot of football. So okay. I'd say the best experience was when I watched Ohio State beat Oregon for the national championship, of course. Wow. Uh, worst experience was two years ago when I had to spend New Year's Eve with my husband. He's a huge Georgia fan <laughs> watching Ohio State lose at the last second of the game. Uh, it was New Year's Eve, so not a great way for us to spend that time together. He was in the basement and I was upstairs and we didn't speak until four o'clock on New Year's Day. But uh, oh. it's all it's all good. It's all good. So <laughs> well, I live are... in SEC land, you know, so I have yes. to listen to yeah. all the SEC football all the time. Yeah. Well, hey, at least here, Mary Kate and Robin. Yeah, Tom's a big Buckeye fan. Uh let's see, Jared is a big Buckeye fan. Now, Katie, uh, uh your colleague there, she's a big bulldog fan. So uh, but that's okay. <laughs> That's yeah. okay. She's good people. Uh, also, Karak Jose, great to see you here today. 
Cheers to the Supply Chain Now team for yet another intriguing session. Cheers from Boston. Great to have you here, as always, co write. Um, all right, Mary Kate, really quick. We were talking. So, those experiences Robin just shared are going to be tough to top. But yeah. when it comes to the Chicago White Sox, because I know you're a passionate Southside fan there in Chicago, or your collegiate experience, what's been your, one of your favorite sports uh, experiences? This one's so easy for me because um, it's not happened since it happened, and I don't think it'll ever happen again in my lifetime. So in 2005, the Chicago White Sox, when they won the World Series, I was in high school. We were absolutely glued to our TVs. We were so excited the whole entire series. If you remember, they went on a run in right. postseason, and they were right. just killing it every game. So that – by far, my family is very big Sox fans, so nothing will ever top that. And, you know, maybe it'll happen again in my lifetime, but at it least will. I have 2005. No, so, well. Scott, I feel really old now. Did you hear her say <laughs> high school? I did. <laughs> I did, Robin, me and you both. Oh, man. Well, hey, getting aside the Mary Kate, Frank Thomas and Jack McDowell and uh, Lance, uh, the center footer, I can't remember his last name right now. I loved those White Sox teams back in the day. Yeah, um, yeah. All right, to be fair, as we close out this chapter and get to work here, there's a bunch of Michigan fans here as well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so not the – Robin, we'll, we'll save all that for later. But uh, yeah. let's see, David and Robert, uh, we got some UC Santa Cruz Banana Slugs fans here <laughs> with Richard. Great to see you, Richard. So y'all keep the comments coming. Um, okay, so Mary-Kate and Robin, we got a lot of good stuff to get into here today. So I want to start with this, though, because we're big believers, Robin, in setting the stage, good context, so we can kind of um, uh, perceive your expertise, you know, kind of from the, uh, the, the right angle. So, Robin, to that end, tell us about a little about yourself and what Transportation Insight does. Sure. Um, so Transportation Insight is a uh, leading logistics provider for really technology and expertise across all modes. So one of the biggest differentiators for us is that as we looked at evolving from our start in LTL in 1999, what our founder did was instead of trying to build technologies and instances to help shippers based on demand, he went out to the market and he acquired companies and leaders in the space in each of those areas. And I became part of Transportation Insight in 2015 when they acquired an organization called Bird Dog Logistics, which was a parcel centric provider. We did parcel audit, business intelligence and contract optimization for clients uh, and so became a part then. So I've been a part of this space um, since prior to that. Uh, it's been a really volatile time, especially with COVID. Mm -hmm. Uh, and such. And uh, my role has morphed through the years at, um, at Transportation Insight, where now I'm responsible for really leading the parcel strategy, uh, which includes uh, the audit teams, the consulting teams, and partnerships with our technology group as well. And then I also have a team of solutions engineers that are involved um, in all opportunities in helping build out and answer client needs and solve problems. So, Man. Okay. Mary-Kate. Um, this might, well, this won't hurt you at all because you're a White Sox fan, but man, when Transportation Insight landed Robin and, and throughout that growth spurt they're talking about, it's kind of like the Atlanta Braves getting, signing Greg Maddox, which led him to the World Series, Mary Kay. What'd you think of Robin's background there? Yeah, this is, like I said, this is kind of a new-ish industry for me. So when we're talking about all these things and how it all fits together, and um, I'm excited to talk about the industry as a whole, too. It's really yes. exciting to me. me and too. a lot that you're overseeing over there, for sure, too. <laughs> well, well, I've got some I've, great teams. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, we, we've met several of them. Uh, and Robin, are you going to be able to also show us how to, beyond all the supply chain expertise, throw a curveball right there on the black outside corner <laughs> for a strike three? No. <laughs> no. All right. All right. Fair no, enough. I probably, I probably do as good throwing the ball as Jason Kelsey did when they first let him do it. Uh, and I think that was a running joke, right? That, yeah. Now, and, so that would be me. Yeah. That's Jason funny. Kelsey is having a lot of fun here lately. But uh, <laughs> yeah. before we move on, I got to give a shout out to the one and only Sophia Rivas Herrera. Great to see you, Sophia. Really appreciate all the great work you're doing out there. And hey, Peter Bolay, all night and all, all day, is back with us over on YouTube. Folks, YouTube is easy. Uh, check us out over there. It's easy to jump on and, and share comments throughout. So y'all keep it coming. Okay, Robin, 
and Mary Kate, we got a ton of stuff to get to here today. I want to start with you know when you when you're out there looking at you know, you work with all the movers and shakers, you got your finger on the pulse of what's going on. When it comes to that global supply chain landscape out there, what are business leaders prioritizing right now, Robin? Yeah, so from a total uh, supply chain perspective, you're still seeing the need to cut costs and mitigate risk, right? That's huge. Understanding that client expectation and service level expectations are still high, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, you've got the whole Amazon effect that has slowed a bit, but still, you know, consumers want to see their packages very quickly, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it be parcel or LTL, et cetera. Um, you know, the market is is having a bit of a delay, right, in, in certain areas. And so there are a lot of uh, industry leaders that are looking at, you know, how do I look at my transportation and supply chain holistically and really drive costs down, improve operations and improve client service at the same time? So yes. there's a lot to be said across all modes. And obviously, you know, the incidences of late with the, the Baltimore ports and things of that nature. Mm-hmm haven't led us to be a really calm environment. Um, and so it's a challenge across really all modes, whether it's parcel, LTL, truckload, drainage, et cetera. Yes. And Mary Kate, Robin's kind of describing the, the holy trifecta, right? Improving <laughs> operations, uh, adding to the bottom line, looking for those cost efficiencies while maintaining, if not increasing service levels to our customers. Your thoughts, Mary Kate? Yeah, you know, as Robin was talking, I was thinking about how important this specific piece of supply chain is when it comes to customer experience and customer satisfaction, right? And so I am not surprised that business leaders are looking at this more and more closely because it directly relates to the experience your customer is going to have. Yes, well said, well said. Uh, All right, I love it in the chat, Robin and Mary-Kate, when Dave poses a question and old TV is right there with an answer. They're having their own discussions, love solving it. the world's <laughs> issues out there. I love that, David and Tom. Larry Klein from Albany, Georgia. I think I got it right this time. Great to have you. And Jonathan Wolschlager. I think I got that right. Good afternoon to you, wherever you're tuned in from. And let us know where you are tuned in. We love making those connections. Okay, Robin, let's see here. So now that we've kind of uh, broadly, you know, you kind of shared us uh, with some priorities there, what business leaders are trying to do. Let's dial it in more on some of the biggest parcel trends that you're seeing here in 2024. What comes to mind, Robin? So parcel has always been a volatile market, right? Um, It's challenging for shippers uh, to really keep their finger on the pulse with parcel and has been for years, even prior to the pandemic and everything that occurred there. Um, 2023 and 2024 parcel is no exception, right? The demand has been muted. There's been less volume um, going into the carriers, but diversification has become a huge area of opportunity for shippers. You know, when the pandemic hit, and I know everybody's tired of hearing about the pandemic, but when the (laughs) pandemic hit, there was a lot of money thrown into these alternative carriers from a, Mm -hmm. A technology perspective, a capability perspective, there were mergers and acquisitions um, that occurred. And it's really put up the competitive side of the market for who we always knew as the leaders in that space, which were UPS and FedEx, right? DHL came to play. Um, and then USPS, um, through its new you know, group, has been very focused on how do we become more competitive. But when you look at regionals in the market, there are about 130 of them out there now. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you can't use 130 different regionals if you're in you know, the space of shipping, right. but it gives you competitiveness. And so the demand's muted, which means the market is a shipper's market now, right? It is definitely a shipper's market. There's increased competition. There's shifting dynamics. And UPS and FedEx are facing challenges from emerging players like Amazon, but also the regionals, the USPS aiming its demand on market share. And then, you know, even with Ground Advantage being the new service offering that Tom Joy just came out and did, it's it's a great um, service. And so they're feeling the pain on that for sure. Um, and you've heard it as you've listened. If you're listening to, you know, their earnings calls, their news releases, right. you're seeing that. So the trend in parcel, to answer your original question, the trends in parcel are really focused on, let's take advantage as a shipper of this market today 
and let's figure out how to minimize our cost, right? Improve our service and also take advantage of some of these new offerings and these new providers that are out there today. Mm. Tons and tons of opportunity, uh, Mary Kate. And, uh, and by the way, folks, make sure we're going to make sure we get folks connected to Robin towards the end. But I love Robin. How you sit in on those earnings calls and then give your analysis. That is yeah. golden stuff. Must yeah. see supply chain stuff. All right. So Mary Kate, as she was describing the parcel market out there, of course, diversification, the rise of the regionals, it's a shipper's market and a whole bunch more good stuff. What stood out to you, Mary Kate? I think that I wasn't aware that we had shifted to a shipper's market. I think, you know, we've all, like you said, Robin, I know we're sick of talking about COVID, but I think we've all been focused on the volatility and the volume, volume that now this shift to the shipper's market affords the opportunity to think about and test out new strategy with this diversification and these regional carriers that come up. I think there's a lot of ways to approach this kind of shift in the market, as you say. Yeah. Excellent point. Excellent point. I got a quick follow-up question for you, Robin, but before I do, I've got to, got to recognize country royalty. George Jones is with us here today from Rocky Mount, North Carolina. Go Tar Heels, he says. Great to have you, George. And I think this is Amanda behind the scenes. Big thanks, Amanda and Catherine. George Jones, my dad's favorite country singer. Welcome, George. Wow, great, that's so cool. <laughs> great to see you, George. All right. So, Robin, hey, really quick, before I move forward, with the, the all this diversification going on, if there was one piece of advice you would offer a shipper out there that might be having new conversations with a new shipper, anything immediately comes to mind that you would advise them to kick the tires on or or ensure is there ensure something is there before they proceed. Um, from a perspective of if you're if you're looking at creating a new agreement or a new partnership with a carrier, right? Is that what you mean, Scott? Yes, yes, that's okay. right. If you're looking at creating a new partnership with a carrier, it's really going to be carrier centric. Um, you know, there's been a lot of change in the market. Um, you know, if you're focused on the USPS, for instance, um, you know, Louis DeJoy has done a great job in bringing more technology, looking at opportunities. He spoke at Parcel Forum, I think it was two years ago, right, right? right? maybe a year ago, and talked about what he was doing to bring in, you know, the postal service into the new decade, right? Um, he's done a great job there. UPS and FedEx are offering new services. So I think it's really important as a shipper to understand, you know, what's my strategy moving forward long term, right? Most of the, the shipper contracts that are in place today were either negotiated right before the pandemic or right during the pandemic, ah. right? Um, and so you've got there's they're typically three year agreements, right? Mm -hmm. So you're you're coming up on that time where they were negotiated 2021 20, time frame when the carriers really had the upper hand. Yeah. And so yeah. as a shipper today, it's really understanding how has my business changed since that point in time, since 21, right? What are my opportunities for improvement, right? Stra strategically, cost-wise, customer service-wise, e-commerce has boomed, right? right? And so how have I morphed? And understanding that is really important. And then the other pieces are too is understanding if you're if you're meeting with a ship with a carrier, you know, what are my capabilities from a distribution perspective, a network perspective, those types of things, because, you know, you can have shippers looking at I've got a small portion of my business that's e-com where a large portion's commercial or vice mm -hmm. versa. Make sure you understand what are the positives for each of these carriers in those areas, yes. right? And so knowing what they do best is really important to you as a shipper when you're walking into those negotiations. So Robin, that is, uh, we need to dedicate a whole series just to your <laughs> last response there, really. Uh, Mary Kate, uh, what stood out to you? I mean, on my end, just where she started, where Robin started about how some of these contracts and service agreements yeah. were either finalized and fully executed before the pandemic or during the pandemic. And of course, so much has changed since then. That is right. a so update and and um, get back with your team and, and try to understand what our objectives are, what our strategies are, right? And then kind of revisit who we're we're shipping with and what those service level agreements look like. But what stood out to you, Mary Kate? 
Yeah. Yeah. That part was really interesting to think about, but also this idea, I mean, we talk about this a, a lot, right? Like finding the right partners for you as your business grows and changes. And um, like you said, Robin, weighing out the pros and cons, because there are more players in the market now, and it does make more sense to diversify in a lot of instances. So um, thinking about that more critically and more holistically yes. um, will probably lead to new partners. Yeah. Well, um, and a lot of times what shippers find, sorry, Scott, but a lot great. of times what shippers find is when they start looking at these alternative carriers, right? Everyone has built their processes and their systems around UPS and FedEx. But there's a lot of opportunity out there that you can leverage if you have, you know, you may not have a TMS that allows you to do that, right? But there's options out there. So don't feel like you're, and I guess the word is married, right? But you're yep. married to one of these national providers because you may want to keep them, you know, for a portion of your business, right? But there's also opportunities with what these regionals and these alternatives have come to the market with, whether it be DHL or the Postal Service or, you know, some of the regionals that are out there today, right? They've, they've divested and they've acquired and they've moved pieces and parts to be the most functional um, at servicing your client, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so they're not, I'm trying to think of the way to word this, they're not trying to please everyone, right? right? But they're able to please you in a way as a shipper that may be extremely impactful to your business. That yes. makes sense. So, yeah. And, and if you look at like a regional carrier, let's just say you have a facility in California, right? Yep. There's some really good regionals out there that can get packages delivered down the whole coast of California in two days, right? right. So two to three days. So it, it really depends on where am I, where do my DC sit? What's my volume? And then how do I leverage those? And there's a lot of opportunities out there. Yep. Okay, I'm trying to fast and furiously capture notes, Rob. I'm going to drop <laughs> stuff there. Uh, all right, uh, let me let me take a couple of quick comments. So, Robin, in a second, I want to keep going. You shared a lot of great advice, and, and a lot of it was centered on current and new opportunities. And I want to dive a little bit deeper in all the opportunities you're seeing out there for companies that ship parcel beyond what you've shared. So, but first, uh, let's see, Nadim says rightly said it is a shippers market. Uh, Chastel, uh, I think I got that right. Chastel, great to have you here from France. Cool. Man, I wonder, uh, uh, our dear friend of the show, Constantine Limbarakis is over in France. And I, and I was just on the phone with him the other day. The weather is gorgeous. So let us know there. Sophia said, knowing what they do best mm -hmm. in terms of the carriers. I love that. Great, great call out there, Sophia. Uh, Larry Klein, always have one more screwdriver in the toolbox. Kind of that diversification that she was talking about. And then Tim, Tim, great to see you. Says DHL was always good with international and hazardous materials shipments in his experience. Good stuff there. All right. Um, so Robin, let's go back to opportunities, yeah. man. And do you have a couple extra hours we could get with you, Robin? Is that okay? <laughs> I, uh, I talk about parcel so much, my family gets nauseous. So I'm <laughs> <laughs> So. Oh, and, well, and Nadim, let me add one more here. It's all about network strength. Yeah. That's an excellent comment, Nadim. Yeah, and that's kind I of one, that. one of the things Robin said a minute ago, using that uh, regional carrier example in California, you know, knowing your footprint, knowing your volume, kind of, you know, connect, you know, connecting all those dots as you making the right decisions amongst the wealth of, of options out there these days. So Robin, back to opportunities, opportunities, uh, continue on any other really massive opportunities uh, for companies that ship parcel in 2024 and moving forward. Yeah. Well, and I don't, I want to take a step back just real fast. I sure. don't want, I don't want shippers to feel like they have to be huge to take advantage of this market. You know um, you know, a lot of people feel like, okay, I'm too small a shipper. I ship, you know, less than $5 million. I can't take advantage of these regional carriers. I, let's just be frank, I, I struggle to hit my commitment tiers to UPS FedEx, right? Right, right. It doesn't mean that your um, your ability to mitigate cost or improve service is, is limited. You know, the carriers, UPS and FedEx, like we talked about a moment ago, they've experienced a lot of decline in volume, and they are really working hard to 
find that capacity or find that volume within there to fill capacity and drive opportunity. So even small shippers are seeing opportunities just to have conversations with your current providers or look at another national provider that can come in and take advantage of that time. And so just to give you an idea, um, about two months ago, we worked with a shipper, $2 million, you know, really luxury boutique shipper. We were able to save them about $450,000, just leading them down the path of how to better optimize their agreements and their network. Right. So you don't have to be huge um, in order to take advantage. Now you do get opportunities like, you know, $38 million shippers who we've saved 29%, things like that. Wow. But there's a lot of opportunity out there, even if you're small to look at, am I leveraging the right service levels? Am I using the right carrier? Am I getting the best cost? Like those are things that you can do no matter your size. Yeah, man. Okay. Yeah, I you know, this up. is my favorite thing, oh, yeah. right? Operational <laughs> efficiency. I'm like, oh, all those like, when you're talking, that makes me so happy. Yeah. Well, and, and more and more shippers are focused on not just the package level, but the SKU level, right? Mm. So how do I look at profitability by yeah. SKU or freight percentage of revenue or freight cogs? And so really getting visibility to all of that data in one place is really important for a shipper today understanding you know my transportation costs right my mm -hmm. my cost to serve my SKU cost right is really understanding you know everybody knows there's got to be some lost leaders especially in e-com right you've yeah. got SKUs that aren't going to make you as much yeah. but understanding your profitability and really being able to dig into that um, to give you one real life, I love to tell stories. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. one real life example, we, we have a, a retailer that sells um, high end furniture. That's mm -hmm. one of our clients. And we were looking at, you know, profitability by SKU and how the large package surcharges the carriers put on him really impact his overall cost to serve and the profitability of his SKUs. And we determined that he has a counter stool that he sells in all of these different colors, right? Well, the one color white, he's very profitable on, but this other color, he's not so profitable mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And when we started digging in at a skew level, we identified that he's losing money on his transportation because when a consumer like me, Robin goes on his website and I'll <laughs> order a, a counter stool, if I order it not white, I usually order at least two. If I order white, I'll order one. Well, he's got transportation costs in his, in his you know, model behind the scenes right. that he's paying he's charging the same thing but he's not making as much money on two three four to be shipped yes and so if you get to a certain point where you're not making money on that skew then you need to re you know reanalyze yeah. it right yeah. and i tease him because i'll go on and i'll google his site and that stool that he doesn't make as much money on pops up you know, so, you know, you have to really look at. So we have yeah. customers that we're helping to look at, not just are they saving money on their carrier contracts, but are they looking at their SKUs right? And are they driving consumer behavior in a right way? Right. Yes. Right. Oh, man. OK, Mary Kate, I'm going to let you react to that first. <laughs> and then I'm going to share about, I don't know, 27,000. Uh, reactions to what Robin was sharing. I love your stories. Keep sharing them, Robin. Yeah, hey, hey. I love I love stories like this too because I can really picture it and how you know supporting someone like this is extremely helpful. But down to that detail, being able to go to, go to SKUs and seeing it, I think you used the word holistic in the beginning of this session, and this is an example of how you've got to get down to the details in order to kind of see the overall picture, right? Um, yes. And I love hearing these types of, I don't want to say projects, but these types of initiatives rather, right? Where you can get down to that detail and you can make better decisions, make more money and um, simplify your overall process. I love that. Yes. And, and and I love it too. And so does many other folks here like Shashi, understanding profitability at the skewed level. This is amazing stuff. Yeah. Great learning. I'm with you, Shashi. And by the way, he's got some other questions maybe we can get to after today's session. Uh, let's see here. Ryan says what we all know. Robin has a wealth of knowledge and is mm -hmm. a true superstar in our, in our industry. <laughs> Be sure to try and keep up, everybody. <laughs> that's yeah, an excellent sure. point. Uh, Shastel, great to have you. Return costs. That's right. Mm -hmm. Reverse logistics, return man, returns management. It doesn't get enough attention. It's getting more attention, thankfully. But 
we need uh we need to put a bigger spotlight on yeah. that as well hey um let me go back to my notes here because you, you were dropping some really good stuff that 450 <laughs> 400 going way back to four hundred fifty thousand dollars as you were yeah. talking about opportunities small shippers have and how it's an opportunity for everybody in this marketplace that is such a great call out um that you you re-emphasized both of y'all did the importance of knowing the business, knowing the data. And that's before I come back to you, Robin, uh, and let's see a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I spent some time <laughs> in the restaurant industry and it's amazing. Uh, kind of on splotchy inside too. It's amazing how a lot of restaurant owners had no idea what a certain plate of food cost their business. Oh, right. Yeah. And so as they are pricing their menus, they, a lot of folks had that big gap. And so the, fast forward to what you're talking about, where you're bringing in the data to truly know your business and then select the right carrier. That is such a powerful point, Robin. Anything else you want to add on that? And we'll keep driving with other opportunities because you are a fount of wisdom here today. Your thoughts, Robin? Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, you mentioned the the plate of food in a restaurant. Yes. That's a really good analogy because it's really hard for shippers to look at all of the data and make sense of it, especially when the carriers keep changing the baseline. Right. Right. So, you know, just in the last, I don't know, three weeks, uh, we've posted, I posted on LinkedIn about the changes in the DAS zip codes, right? That UPS yep. and FedEx are going to be putting in place. UPS went live this week, FedEx next week. They're calling them DAS surcharges, right? But really what they should be calling them is congestion surcharges because mm. in a lot of people's mind, DAS surcharges are for remote areas. These zip codes, these 82 zip codes they've rolled out are more congested areas. They're they're probably impacting a lot of people on this call today, right? Boston, right. New York, LA, Chicago. These are areas where it, they're going to take advantage of shipping and delivering to those areas, right? And and roll in additional fees. Mm -hmm. Not to mention then in, you know, later this year, they're looking at changing the zones. So you're shipping a zone two package now, it may become a zone three package, which means more expense. So being able to dig into the data and really understanding each of those surcharges and fees and how they impact your overall transportation cost, right? Your carrier cost and your SKU cost is really important. Yes, Robin. Yes. All right. So I'm going to get Mary Kate's reaction, share a couple of quick comments. And in a second, Robin, unless you have, well, I know you have more opportunities, but I definitely want to touch on planning, planning, planning next. So we'll circle back around uh, really quick. Alvin says, great to see you, Alvin. Sign me up for, for yeah. Parcel 101. I'm with me you. Too. This yeah. is fascinating stuff. Uh, and let's see here. Tim says, uh, dim weight, dimensional weight is another little known challenge. Excellent call out there, Tim. Uh, all right. Now she mentioned, Robin mentioned Mary Kate, and I've got this list uh, of, of locales that she was talking about. Chicago's on there. Mary Kate says, don't mess with Chicago. Yeah, your, come on. Your thoughts with what she was just sharing there, Robin. No. Oh, that, sorry, Mary Kate, sorry. Oh, uh, no, that's all right. I, um, so I was thinking about, you know, being able to keep on top of all of these things. Robin, as you're listing them off, you know, you're an expert in these things. I'm definitely not. But listing off all of these different zone changes, all these different fees that come up, would sound overwhelming, right, at first, but not if you, you know, have an expert like yourself, you're able to walk through it and advise companies how to navigate this and even probably a little bit of making predictions for the future, you know, with right. some of your industry predictions. Um, that's helpful in thinking about more long term strategy rather than just like, eh, whatever, this is how we do it. This is our spend. It's going to go up, but we can't deal with that right now, you know, right. Kind of well, and I, and I don't, oh, I'm sorry, Scott. I was no, just going to say, Robin. I don't want it to become a transportation insight commercial, right? But <laughs> yeah, you, you yeah. can, you can find this information. Like if you follow individuals on LinkedIn, right? Mm -hmm. You, you get information from, from situations like this, right? Yeah. You don't have to go with a provider that can do that. Now I'll tell you, you know, it's nice to have that partner in your back corner that's got their ear to the ground and knows what's coming because a lot of times the carriers won't do a newscast and say, this is what I'm doing. They just right. change the rate in their, in their website, you know, and right. then all of a sudden you're seeing your fuel go up. Right. Um, so things like that occur, but 
there's a lot of ways for shippers to stay on the pulse of it. It's just, it could become a full-time job for you if yeah. you're not, you know, if you don't have a partner or a way yeah. to leverage this. And, and let's face it, transportation and supply chain teams aren't normally the first teams in a company that get a lot of money. Yes. Right. So right. they have a right. low, they have a low bandwidth. They've got few individuals on the team. They're responsible for driving a lot of opportunity. And they're also not in a lot of cases brought up early. Like, you know, marketing can say, I'm going to run a free, I went into a meeting one time. I'll never forget. Um, probably five years ago. And I yep. walked into this meeting and I sat down in front of a transportation logistics director and she was very upset and it was, it was, visible. And I said, what's the matter? And I said, if you don't have time to meet, we can, we can go and do it another day. And she said, no, she said, I just found out that my marketing group has put a spiff on our website for free shipping. And she said on all clearance items, she said, so I'm shipping 77 cent socks and paying $4 and 85 cents. Oh my God. So yeah. nobody had come to her and said, tell us how much it's going to cost to deliver yeah. these. And they had just made this decision. We want to get rid of this. Uh, had another customer that I got on a call with last year and they had a fitness step that they had decided they wanted to get rid of in their DC and they had done these fitness steps at cost. Well, when we started adding in all of the surcharges and fees that they'd been impacted by because these steps were ugly freight, right? Is what we yeah. call it. They had been impacted so much that they were losing money on those steps. Oh, so gosh. really, you know, and nobody from transportation had been asked. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So making sure they have the visibility to go to their leadership and say, this is what's impacting our transportation and supply chain costs. And here's how you could improve this. Yes. Like, that's really important. Oh, watch out for ugly freight out there, folks. It is a real deal. Uh, Robin, I love the stories and anecdotes. So many folks, I'm sure, can relate to those situations because it happens all too often every day. Now, we, we've got a lot of questions here, which I'd encourage folks from Charles. Great to see you here, Charles. Charles to uh, David's got some questions. Hey, that's going to be perfect over a cup of coffee and maybe an adult beverage, either or after today's <laughs> webinar. And I bet Robin and the team will lean into that. Also want to uh, acknowledge, uh, uh, we're going to touch on this at the end too, but Katie, uh, Katie here drops a great link to uh, what things to keep in mind when looking at diversifying your carrier mix. That's a great blog article. We're also going to mention a little bit later. Um, there's one other thing. Marcus mentioned a great time to look at your parcel agreements is when you get acquired or you're acquiring other organizations. I think that's a great tip, uh, Robin, right? Good tip. Yeah. yeah good tip. Um, all right. Good stuff there. All right. So um, how about, let's talk about planning, 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 and more planning. Cause is there anything we do in this lifetime as supply chain practitioners, it is plan, right? Now, yeah. thankfully technology is really helping in powerful ways, the human factor, right? Uh, to plan even better these days, looking around corners, predicting what's going to happen seven years. No, I'm kidding. Seven <laughs> days maybe uh, ahead. We're trying. But Robin, I want to pick your brain here today when it comes to planning. In your view, what should business leaders and their supply chain practitioners be doing right now for parcel planning throughout the year and into next year? Well, so from a planning perspective, I think it's important that you take advantage of the market the way it is today first. So, you know, you may be in a contract, you may be a shipper that is, you know, two years into a four year agreement or two years into a three year agreement, you may have a penalty. I would, I would ask you to look at what is the ROI on maybe possibly getting out of that agreement, even with that penalty, right? Yep. There with, if you signed a four or five year, three, four, five year agreement during the carrier market, let's look at this opportunity and then let's plan accordingly. So let's say you do the evaluation on that penalty and it's not worth it to make that move, then start looking at how do I invest in my technology or how do I partner with someone that has the technology to allow me to diversify, to allow me to get into some of this data where we have a lot of, of customers that struggle with third party shipping visibility and things of that nature, 
they come to us saying, I don't really have a good way to manage and monitor my direct to consumer shipments from other vendors, right? I don't have a good way to manage and monitor who's using my accounts and if they're using them accurately and appropriately. Hmm. Look at your technology. So when you're looking at budgeting for the next two, three, four years, know that the parcel market right now is ripe. So go for it hard right now. Plan for volumes to stay pretty steady. Um, we believe they're going to stay pretty steady this year, but carriers are going to continue to diversify. Some of the 130 regionals that are out there will probably go away. There may be some acquisitions and mergers that occur. There's going to be a lot more competitive market, but you as a shipper, no matter how small or big you are, you need to be able to take advantage of that. And if you're hamstrung because you use one of the national carriers execution platforms, right, and you don't have technology or IT to do that, plan for that. Ask for right. that next year or the following year. Get yourself where you need to go. Yes. Mm -hmm. Get yourself where you need to go. Mary Kate, I'll give you a chance to respond to that first. Yeah. And I think it's about allowing yourself to be responsive to the market too, right? Like taking an inventory of what technology you're using, what contracts you're in, who you're working with and making sure you're flexible enough to be responsive to this new market now and also how the market will continue to change in the future. Yes. Cause that is for certain change will continue. It'll probably get continue to accelerate as well. Uh, so we've got to work with the pros. We got to invest in the right technology, as Robin's talking about. And what what both of y'all have been pounding throughout the conversation is got to bring the right all the data and the right data, and really understand what we're trying to do, what our objectives are. Get the data, and then enter into the decision making. Right? Um, quick comment there. Uh, a couple of quick comments. First off, uh, Jared says. Parcel Masterclass with Robin Meyer. I can see it now. <laughs> I love that, I love yeah. that Jared. Uh, I would add, I would add another show idea, The Ugly Freight Chronicles, Robin. Can we, can we <laughs> work with your agent? Oh, the stories, the stories. I also want to go back to an opportunity you touched on that, that I really I want to uh, spike the football on this because I think it's important. A lot of our listeners will be impacted. You're talking about those DAS surcharges that FedEx and UPS are rolling out, 82 zip codes. So, folks, we mentioned Chicago and, and some others, but, hey, Key Biscayne, Florida, Los Angeles, California, San Francisco, uh, South Boston, Oakland, let's see, Miami, Belmont, California, Bronx, Brooklyn, and a whole bunch more. So if you are – uh, that if, if that's going to be impacting you and your business, you might want to reach out mm -hmm. to somebody, some expert out there, but uh, to include Robin, right? Yeah. Well, there's 41,000 zip codes in wow. the U.S., 41,700 okay. and something. Okay. And 61 and a half percent of those zip codes are now impacted by DAS. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Like that's, oh. a, that's a pretty impactful number if you're shipping um, parcel. Mm-hmm. Excellent point there. How about that? You, you say 61% of those 41,000? 61, 61 and a half are applicable to DAS surcharges now. Wow. Mary Kate. Mary I have Kate. no idea. Yeah. You got to get to work. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, all right. So before we move into some resources, before we make sure folks know how to connect with you, Robin, uh, and really have enjoyed, um, you know, we already have a master class here before we even launched the new series that, uh, who was that, Jared, that suggested? Love that. Um, any other planning tips? Any other planning tips before we move forward? And I know, I know there's, you know, we could spend hours probably talking about, you know, supply chain planning, uh, freight planning, transportation planning, but is there any other tip you want to make sure you put out here today with our listening and viewing audience? Yeah, I would say, you know, obviously focus on the tech, understand your carrier contracts and where you stand from a, a perspective of, you know, market share opportunity. Yeah. The other piece is, you know, evaluate your, your distribution model, your network, right? Understand why am I choosing to ship the way I'm choosing to ship? And understand that, you know, there may be opportunities out there for you to use national carriers and ship farther zones. Right. I mean, UPS, there was all this talk um, when, you know, FedEx lost the USPS air contract with UPS. Yeah. Right. And everybody was like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? 
it could possibly be that FedEx said, look, you know, we're already losing money on this and we're not willing to continue to do so because they're working on separate networks. UPS has a single network. So with that single network, they can take advantage of a lot of their ground and such for the USPS delivery that FedEx couldn't take advantage of, right? So understanding how the carriers work differently, um, you know, if you are looking at longer zones, you may be a better fit for UPS because they can deliver up to a thousand miles in two days. But if you're working with separate distribution centers, you may be a better fit for FedEx or for a regional carrier or somebody like that. So look at your distribution. The other thing that I would say is look at when we talk about tech, look yeah. at your TMSs and make sure they're actually routing appropriately. If you only update your TMS once a year at the beginning of the year, all of these changes the carriers are making are going to impact which service and which carrier you should be using. So make sure that you're appropriately bandwidth so that you can make those changes within your TMS as well. And then finally, I would say planning, right? Look at your SKUs and know that the carriers are only going to get more competitive on that. You know, do we want to ship this ugly freight? They're going to start passing even more rules. And if you're shipping furniture or long items or heavy items or bulky items, you know, how do I impact that? And are there opportunities for me to improve my packaging, my product category? What? So that you're not getting impacted by that. Okay. Robin keeps on delivering the good stuff here today. Mary Kate, we might have to bolt on an extra hour here. This is great <laughs> stuff here. Uh, as Nadim says, Robin Meyer, very impressive. Really good stuff there. And he also says, keep in mind, as we all touched on this earlier, mm -hmm. your reverse logistics cost too. That's right. Yeah. You got a plan there as well, for sure. Mary Kate, respond. Uh, gosh, she, she covered a gamut, especially um, I loved her point that she just made. You know, if your TMS updates just at the beginning of the year rather than more dynamically, right. watch out. You got big problems. But Mary Kate, what'd you hear there in all of Robin's planning wisdom? Yeah, I think that's a great word, Scott, that keeps coming through to me is being more dynamic, right? You have to be not just in your tech that you're using, but with your partners, with your carriers, you have to be able to be more dynamic and think about this a little bit differently as rules are updated, as the market shifts. Um, I think dynamic is a really good word for kind of what we're preaching here. Yes, that's right. Uh, and Robin's preaching loud for the folks in the back, which I love that, Robin. <laughs> Katie says, hey, keep those TMSs, partial or otherwise, updated. That is a great reminder and a great T-shirtism here today. Um, question for you, Robin. Uh, so you were talking much earlier before we start to wrap here, and I think that TMS point reminded me once again. So for folks out there, Robin, that may not be directly in the transportation, making those freight decisions, maybe they're on the peripheral, maybe they're in, maybe they're in the C-suite, CSCOs or something, um, that, that perhaps given when those, a lot of contracts have been executed, again, pre-pandemic or during the pandemic, maybe should they, be, they should be asking the question of their teams. Hey, let's look at, show me, show me the contracts we've got in place. Should, is, would you advise that, Robin? Yeah. Most definitely. This is the time to look at that and see what the opportunity um, is that presents itself for sure. Um, and even as I said, even if you decide now, a lot of um, a lot of shippers can get a little nervous about the penalty language. Right. Um, because they feel like if they even raise their hand and say, hey, you know, I'm concerned about my pricing, that they maybe get hit with that. Um, but, you know, if you have a great partner and there are there are great partnerships between UPS and shippers and FedEx and shippers and DHL and shippers, don't yep. get me wrong. But if you have a great relationship with your rep, with your account representative from those carriers, just say, hey, I feel like my shipping has changed. My models morphed a bit. You know, my network has changed. Can we evaluate and make sure I'm getting the best bang for my buck here? right? There's nothing to say if they're a good partner with you, they're going to visit that and they're going to have that conversation. Um, and so understanding the opportunities out there. And there are a lot of different solutions now that really, you know, you look at hundred weight programs, you look at all these different things that you might not have even had the advantage of prior to the pandemic that now yeah. you can consider. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Robin, 
as we start to wrap, you said small shippers have opportunities. So as we approach holiday season here in the Luton household, can I can, can you be our consultant and help us bring <laughs> these these shipping Thank costs you. down? Hey, uh, uh, yeah, my my husband would ask the same thing, Scott. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but let me uh, tell you. So residential deliveries, the density is what causes them to be more expensive because when you get commercial, you usually get three packages where you get. My husband says that we should be a multi-commercial because <laughs> I'll have. 12 packages show up at my house one day. Um, I don't, I don't like to go shopping. <laughs> oh man. Love it. All right. Love it. We come full circle here, full circle. Uh, and as Larry Klein says, need some good old fashioned relationship building, which is kind of one of the points that Robin mm -hmm. said a minute ago. Good stuff there. All right. So Mary Kate in a minute, I'm going to get your patented key takeaway here today from that's going to be a tough, you better bring in an audit team today to, to narrow that down because there's a lot of good stuff here today. Um, but in the meantime, first off, I want to start with this, Robin. Uh, I know you do a lot of keynote speaking out there. You mentioned a couple events already and y'all stay busy. But if folks want to sit down uh, and compare notes with you, have a have one of these conversations that, that you're talking about, um, how can they reach out to you, Robin? Yeah, definitely. So they can reach out to Transportation Insight at our website. They can also go to LinkedIn and connect with me. Um, I post a lot of information about things that are happening in the carrier market. We've talked a lot today about the consulting side of it. We also do a full audit and you'd be amazed at how many things get missed, right? Within invoicing and rating and all of those things. So, you know, follow me on LinkedIn, connect with me on LinkedIn as well. Um, that's all great ways to connect with me. That's right. And make sure you tune in for when Robin does a report out on these analyst calls. It's really, really good stuff. Okay, we got some more resources for y'all uh, from the Transportation Insight team. Let's see here. I like this, the Parcel News Buzz. Hey, Mary-Kate, we're big fans of anything Buzz related, right? Exactly, and uh, I love this. The quick updates on this is amazing. Yes, so y'all check that out. We're going to drop a link to the Parcel News Buzz that the Transportation Insight team powers, so check that out. And also... I think we touched on this earlier, but want to make sure I'm a visual learner. So I got to see it. This great blog article, considerations to keep in mind when diversifying your parcel carrier mix. So we're dropping a link to that as well. Good stuff there. And hey, old TV says Robin is the parcel guru, <laughs> as in the Ohio State. That's high <laughs> praise. That is high praise. And hey, Nadim wants a contract with your agent too and have you come out and do a doctor supply chain webinar. How about that, Robin? There you go. I tell you, you've set the world on fire here today. Okay. <laughs> Big thanks for you being here. But before we leave, before we leave, I want to make sure, Mary Kate, we've covered a wide gamut, right? And we're really just scratching the surface with what Robin and the TI team are up to because I've seen it in person. Uh, Mary Kate, what's one key takeaway that folks got to take away front and center that cannot forget from this conversation? Well, we had so many today, as, as we said, <laughs> right? But I love how maybe I think it was Nadim who kind of put it together in one of his comments about thinking about this through your network strength, right? And your network strength is something we always talk about in supply chain, but especially here today. But thinking about network in your tech, your carriers, and in the market, right? Are you able to kind of respond and be dynamic in those three areas um, will bring your whole network and strengthen your network to a place where... Um, you can delight your customers, you can save money, you can do a lot of great things. Yes. And make it easier on your team Yes, to delight your customers, right? And find more success in what they do day in and day out. And that is probably one of the most noble callings that we all have here. Um, what a great point to wrap on here. Uh, all right. Again, folks, we dropped the links to those two resources there. Uh, let's see the blog article and the parcel news buzz and Robin's LinkedIn profile. We're trying to make it easy. You're one click away from, from checking all that stuff out. All right. Robin Meyer with transportation insight. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. You bet. Uh, good luck to the Buckeyes. We'll talk more soon. Uh, Mary Kate love. Great to have you as always here today. Yeah, this was awesome. Thanks so much, Robin and Scott. You Thank bet. You. Hey, folks, man, what a lively audience here today. I know we hit, didn't hit everybody's question or comment. Robin and the team welcomes that. I bet there'll be some post-live stream discussions. But thanks for being here. Big thanks to Catherine and Amanda and Katie, kind of behind the scenes for helping to make today happen. But hey, folks, here's the challenge. 
you got to take Robin laid out 37 things easily, maybe 67 <laughs> things. The key though is to take one and act on it today, right? Your team members are waiting. They're looking for new solutions, new ways of doing business differently. Make it happen. Lip service, lip service leadership doesn't cut it. It's all about deeds, not words. And with that said, on behalf of our entire team here at Supply Chain, now Scott Luton challenging you to do good, to get forward, and to be the change. We'll see you next time right back here at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.